I'm Mike Vardy. Meal planning is important because it prevents us from being a disappointed wreck when dinner time comes around and we have no clue what to make or even if we have the ingredients to make the meal. It's a time and a money saver, but most importantly, it frees up valuable brain space. Creating a meal plan prepares us for the week to come and gives us peace of mind that we're organized and can feed ourselves and our family. That's why I do it, and that's why Plan to Eat helps me do it. Your subscription includes access to the Plan to Eat website and fully featured mobile apps on iOS and Android. And Plan to Eat gives you the tools to clip and organize recipes from any website, the ones your family loves and that fit your dietary preferences and needs. And you can create a meal plan around your schedule. Then what happens is the Plan to Eat software automatically creates an organized shopping list based on your plan. So sign up for your free trial at plantoeat.com slash timecrafting. That's plantoeat.com forward slash timecrafting. The coupon will be automatically applied to your account and can be used when you're ready to subscribe. It's valid for new customers only. Give Plan to Eat a try today. And this is the Productivityist Podcast. Welcome to the show, everybody. It's Mike Vardy here, your host and your party host, your podcast party host. For the Productivity is Podcast. And this week I have Jared Brown on the show. He's of Hubstaff. And one of the things that, that I wanted to talk to him about on the show is how to manage remote teams. How to do that because I'm doing that. And I want to more lead remote teams and manage them because all the people I work with across the miles are phenomenal. But uh, I wanted to get a better sense of not just how to do that remotely, but how to, you know, what's the practice? What's What are some best practices? What are some tactics and tools and tricks? Even some, some of the the tips that he has that I can wrap my head around quickly and easily and just move the ball forward on that front because I'm still getting better at delegating. Uh, you know, productivity is for a long time was a one man operation. Now there's several people that are involved and I need to get better at that. I heck, I need to get better at doing that. Like with the fact that my wife's a partner in this business of getting her stuff to do. So, um, this this episode is just as much for me as it is for you, and I hope you enjoy it. Here's my conversation with Jared Brown of Hubstaff here on the Productivityist Podcast. Enjoy. I'd like to welcome Jared Brown to the Productivityist Podcast. Jared, thanks for joining me this week. Thanks for having me on, Mike. So uh, I wanted to talk to you. You, you. We kind of you know had a bit of a back and forth uh, via email, um, and uh, I, I wanted to talk to you a bit about uh, remote working with teams. Um, we just had an episode, the, the previous episode of this one, which we'll, we'll mention in the, uh, we'll put in the show notes about, um, you know, kind of how to make teamwork work, uh, whether you're in an office environment or whether you're working remotely. Now you, you specialize basically in remote working at this point and working productively with remote teams, right? Yeah. So my, my startup hub staff, we've always had a remote team for that. So we've been remote from the beginning and, uh, we think it works really well for us. So, so for me, what we've been doing is almost all of my team is based outside of where I live. And I live in Victoria, British Columbia. So, I mean, there's not too many people here that would I be able to, to hire from anyway. So when someone is trying to work with a team that is across the miles and, and obviously, you know, working in different time zones and things like, like how, how can someone like myself, who's got a business that's scaling, how can they kind of manage that while they're managing the scale at the same time. Yeah. And something that I tell people a lot too is because people see remote as a lot harder to pull off. And I have a little bit different perspective on it. I think if you're doing managing your remote team correctly, it's making you use a lot of best practices that would benefit you even in an office environment. And what I mean by that is setting up very clearly what people are supposed to be working on. You know, it forces you to be very clear. You can't just walk by somebody's desk and and iterate on that or, you know, see that maybe they, they have a question or they're not doing the right thing and, and, and get them to change tact a little bit. Instead, spend the time up front and clearly define what it is that you want them to accomplish this week. And we'll do it in the form of sprints. And then build in the accountability that you don't have to feel like it's necessary to follow up with them. They're going to let you know as they're working through that, if they have any questions, send you maybe a daily progress update, something we do a lot at Hubstaff, but make them accountable for it. So give them what they need up front and then let them work on their terms, their time, wherever they want. That part doesn't really matter. And then they're accountable for finishing it. And that pro- that process never really ends, does it? I mean, I'm working with a VA right now. Uh, and she's based in the, in the U.S. She's phenomenal. 
Um, but you know, I'm at the point now where, where I need to go in a bit of a different direction. Uh, and, and the, the cool thing is, is, and I think a lot of people neglect this is that they train the one person and then they don't have a system in place to make sure for, for, uh, you know, for succession. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and we are very big in, in that training process. So what we do is really a combination of Google docs and we'll just type those up. They're pretty raw in the beginning and we treat them as living documents that are constantly being updated and, and made more formal. And then we will also record screencasts. We like to use jing.com uh, to do that. And we'll just record nothing longer than a five minute screencast and keep it you know, nice and tight right around what it is that the process is covering. And people can just you know, really get up to speed with that very quickly. So when it comes to building a remote team, where do people really need to start? Other than the finding process, you know, where, where do people really need to kind of, if, if they want to build an effective remote team, where should they start? I think number one, it, it's going to start with you. It's going to start with how well are you working uh, on the project? How, how disciplined are you? Are you, you know, covering a lot of the details? All of that is going to set the culture. That's going to set the standard that others are going to live by within your team. So I think getting that right is step number one. Then finding people that fit well with, with your style uh, of communication or the type of product or service that you're selling, that's step number two. And for that, I, I don't have a single way of finding those people. You really just go out, you know, try social, go out and search LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a very powerful database for us that we, we don't pay for any special access. We just go out and find people through LinkedIn. It's actually how Dave and I found each other to start Hubstaff in the first place. Uh, and just go out and try to find a few people to talk to and then get on Skype and, and chat with them and tell them what you're into, uh, the culture of your company and how you work and see if they agree with that. I mean, and I agree. I think that that I mean, that's one of the things that 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 I found is that the challenge for me has been to kind of get clear on. I mean, and Chris Ducker's got some great stuff on here. I'm working with virtual assistants and stuff like that. But when you're building a team that that is dedicated to to you, and it's it's not just you know one person, but it's a whole group of people. Um, my my challenge has always been what to let go of. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. And even today, several years into this. It is something that I struggle with every day is how involved should I be? And it's a little scary. We're at a point now with Hubstaff where we're scaling to the size that I can't. I just simply cannot be involved in all the decision making, even just on the technical side. And uh, it's scary. But on the other hand, I'll see some of the emails flying back and forth coming out of Pivotal Tracker, which is what we use on the technical side. And I see that the team's covering it and that they're doing exactly what they should be doing. And it, it's just amazing to see that you've built this thing that's working correctly and the team has the right culture and the right people in it. And it, it's working without your direct hand being involved. Let's shift gears for a second. Let's talk about the building of the startup. So how long has Hubstaff been around for? About two and a half years. Okay. So you're obviously in that and you said you're scaling, you know, there, there's a scale that's happening right now that kind of is putting you in a position where you, you're putting more teams on and so you're adding to the team. But when someone is starting out with a startup, and I mean, you know, that there are many people out there that are just building their business, like what kind of advice do you have? And I know there's an article here, which I'm definitely going to link to, uh, that you wrote for, uh, for Inc, um, Inc.com. But what, what kind of advice do you have for somebody who's like, you know, saying, Hey, I'm, I'm getting started, uh, I don't know what to do next. I mean, I've got this idea. It's, it's, P I've, I've, you know, proof of concept it's, it's people are into it. Um, I've got some, you know, some, uh, validation. How do I, how do I make this thing work over not just the short term, but the long term? Right. So yeah, number one, be prepared as I'm sure that the person in the situation already is to wear most of the hats for quite a while, because unless you're going out and getting uh, significant funding, you're going to need to be the guy to do you and your co-founders. Uh, if you have them, you're going to, you guys will be the ones doing the vast majority of the work. Now, you know, in our case, what we did is from day one, we hired two programmers that I know very well. And uh, we were able to fund that out of pocket. So, so we, did that. but we just had those two programmers and then myself, and my founder. So my co-founder covered everything that wasn't development related. 
And I tried to help with that as much as I could. And then myself and the two developers, we handled everything on the software side. And we had a web component to it and we had to make desktop apps for for three, you know, all three operating systems. So we had quite a bit of work on the development side to do. But you just really have to, uh, you've got to bootstrap it, I think, until you can get to the point you can hire somebody. And for us, that was about a year, uh, a full year before we got into a position where we could actually hire somebody else. You know, all of us felt like we were kind of the founding members. And then a year later, we've hired in the first person into into this cool party we had going on. It's like, you know, welcome to the party. What about when... And this is, it's interesting because you mentioned that you, people that you knew, and I've been working with, with uh, this hiring process right now and living in a small city, especially, and again, this is more not remote, but they will be working remotely. I mean, the nice thing is I offer flexible hours and they can work from home and stuff, but um, what about letting someone go? Like, how do you handle that? I mean, I, I don't know if you've come across that yet. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, you have. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. So how have you handled that? Because when you're dealing with a remote person, like, I mean, we, we've seen, you know, the movies up in the air where, you know, the guy is hired to go in and basically, you know, cull, for lack of a better term. Like, how do you do this from a remote sense? Because, I mean, we've seen it done remotely in films like that where it's just they go into a room and there's a guy on video that says, well, um, you know, we're moving in a different direction. Da, da, da. Like, so how do you how do you ha- how have you handled that? And how do you yes. re- how do you recommend people handle it? Yeah, it, it's it's I, I hate having to do it. Um, I guarantee you will have to do it at some point if you're in business for multiple years, uh, even with a great hiring process in place. It just happens. Um, uh, so what uh, for me the first time that I had to do it, I actually Googled uh, for some articles on on good tips for that, and one that I found said this is what really stuck with me: just really keep it super short. Keep the discussion very short. I like to do it over Skype. You know, I don't like doing it over email. I think that's a little too impersonal. And just without getting too accusatory, because it's not really the point to lay it all out there, but just say in a way, like, this is not a good fit. This is, uh, you know, maybe give a few reasons, very light, and ones that can't really be argued. You know, you don't want to get into a debate. That's the number one thing you're trying to avoid in a call like this. You don't want it to become... Because the debate is going to get escalated, and mm-hmm. we've had we did actually run into that situation during one of these calls, and it got to the point where we just had to end the call. You know, we were like, "Okay, I'm sorry," and we ended it. Right. We we agree to disagree. Exactly. Yeah. You do not want to go back and forth on this. You want to just deliver the bad news and keep it to I would say five minutes or less is the goal. Once you hit that five minute mark, you're probably getting into dangerous territory. And, and then just be done with it. It's ripping off a Band-Aid. Now, what about when you're bringing somebody on to kind of test the waters? Do you have a, like a, a way that you do that? And I've, I've talked to my friend, uh, you know, Jamie, Jamie Tardy uh, over at uh, Eventual Millionaire. And she she kind of gave me an instance of and I think we talked about that in a recent episode about, um, you know, how how we uh, how she, you know, kind of tests the waters with with certain remote teammates. How do you how do you approach that? Yeah, great question. I I forgot to mention this is my last answer, but I wanted to because I think this is the linchpin right here. So perfect question. Uh, We have found that 99% of the people we let go, it may be 100, I think, but I'm I'm leaving a little bit open there, uh, have been fired in the first four weeks, four to six weeks of us working with them. And so that told us we can determine this very early on. If they make it past that period, they're with us for years uh, or unless they take another job. But, it, you know, it, it's ending for different reasons, not because they're not good at doing this job. Uh, so we are big believers in a trial period now. And we state that from the very first call with with a potential candidate that we will do it as a, you know, if, if you decide this is a good fit and we decide it's a good fit, we'll try it out for four to six weeks. We set that in the contract terms. And you know, sometimes we'll even pay a higher rate right in the beginning because it's more uncertain and then we'll go down to a lower rate and increase the hours after the trial. But that gives us a chance to much more cleanly break things off, much more easily break things off if it's just not working in that initial trial trial period. If you make it through that, I'd be willing to bet this person is going to is going to work well for a very long time for you. Now, let's dive in a bit back to the whole, you know, 
you, you just mentioned some stuff. Ruby Rails, I have no clue. None. None whatsoever. I, I have no... And the thing is, I have no interest in knowing that. So how do you... One of the things you mentioned in that Inc. article is work with people smarter than you. So when you're starting out, obviously, you guys are bootstrapping, you're hustling, you're learning as much as you can. Um, how freeing is it? And how, again, how scary is it probably at the same time when you can say, hey, this person I'm bringing on knows way more about Ruby than I would, they, they've forgotten more than I could even know. Like, how do you handle that? And then how do you, further, furthermore, keep them around? Like, so that, because <laughs> you want the smart people to be with you so that they can hopefully influence others within, even, even across the miles, right? Yep. Yeah, and for that, I would say it's the old adage of of A players attract A players. And the second you let a B player in, then you've got C players, and it kind of goes downward. So we we will all comment, especially in that trial period, we're all going to be commenting on that person's code and really looking at what they're doing. And yes, we went through the interview process with them and tried to look at some sample code and see what their prior experience is. But there's no way to really know until you have them do the work. So when they're doing that work right in the beginning, we are we put it under a microscope. And it is unsettling to some people. And in one or two cases, we've, we've found that it just wasn't a good fit because the person just was not really going to deal with that well. But for those that can make it through this gauntlet, I'll, I'll, I'll say, I mean, it, it's kind of trial by fire. It's, it's probably not comfortable uh, in the very beginning because everything you're doing is getting questioned. But it gives you that chance to stand up for what you're doing. Have, if you have confidence in why you made that choice and you can make good points as to, as to why you did it, you're going to earn yourself a spot on the team. And then once you're part of this team, because of the caliber and the culture of all of us learning from each other and raising each other's game, that alone, I think, is a huge uh, reason why people will stay with us. We'll, we'll retain these good developers for, for so far the lifetime of, of this business, two and a half years. So I think that that's a big part of it. Um, and if you do lose somebody from the team, look at where they're going. Because oftentimes, even though you lost them, the silver lining could be that that you did lose them to somebody who's really high caliber as well, another company. And it shows that your process is working well. You're, you're choosing the best. So, you know, we have a Skype channel set up and we all like to, to geek out on the Skype channel. I know the marketing guys love to show each other cool marketing stuff on there. Just create a culture of sharing and everybody raising each other's game. And people want to come to work every day to be a part of that. That's a great way to kind of segue into what I want to talk about in terms of building a company culture over across the miles. How do you do that? Because, I mean, I've noticed it's happening here. And obviously, there's some different approaches that can happen with that. You know, I mean, we were talking before the, the call about, uh, you know, again, that last episode where, where we talked about, you know, a, a modified version of holacracy, where, you know, everyone has their roles as opposed to positions and stuff like that. So how do you foster that? You've kind of touched on it a bit. But how do you how do you begin the process of, of you know, kind of integrating a, a, a culture of your company across, you know, the digital, you know, divide. Yeah, I'd say step number one, make sure that you have some personality that comes through in, in what you're typing. A lot of it is going to be in, in written form, a lot of your communication. You'll have Skype calls as well. So make sure that you're a real person on those calls. Uh, you know, Don't just dictate uh, a few sentences of exactly what the task is and be done. You know, We'll add humorous comments on things. We're not a silly bunch of people. We're not just joking all day long, but you can tell there's a real person on the other end. And if we run into a bug that's just a real hairball, you know, we'll we'll talk about that for a minute and say this thing, you know, this thing is a hairball. And, you know, we're now we got to try to pick this thing apart and figure out what's going on. And, you know, so we we know that there's that person on the other end. And I think that can get lost if you're just very clinical or all of your t all of your communication is very sanitized and just work related. You've got to let some of you seep into that. The other thing I'd say is this is also where I think being remote forces you to do habits that would be good even in an office environment or running a, a company that's being built locally. And that is to document some of this culture. Most companies don't do that. When you're remote, you really do need to. So we'll, we have like a culture document, which is it seems like it'd be antithetical to creating a culture. But we'll just kind of put stuff in there that you know let you know, hey, it's acceptable. Like you know, if you're 
running into a problem or want to use emoticons or whatever the various situations are, you know, go for it. We encourage that. And people can read through this when we first bring them on. The other thing we do is we've documented how the company got started and what Dave and I are like. You can read through a bunch of blog posts from the early days and in our growth series on our blog. It talks about how we started the business, why we started it, you know, why is it remote? What are the principles of this business? And we find that people, even before we hire them, have read through a lot of this stuff and they feel like they know us to a certain extent. They've listened to us on podcasts. You know, it's kind of amazing some of the people that will come to us and in that first candidate interview, they're talking to us about, oh, like when you guys did this, like, wow, you you studied up on us, which wouldn't be that possible if you're in an office environment because you probably don't have all that content out there. Right, right. And the other thing I think that's important that I, I strive to do, and I'm sure you do as well, is making sure the communication is varied. So like you said, you know, not just the type of like, not just the, the candor in which you carry yourself with the communication, but also, again, like you said, Skype. So you get the voice, the intonation, because, you know, there's nothing yep. worse than just seeing a bunch of digital communication without having that, you know, that human element behind it. We say, hey, you know, I've heard your voice or I've seen your face as opposed to just, well, thanks for that, that email or thanks for that communication via Trello or whatever. Absolutely. So before we wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about tools because we've touched on them a little bit here throughout the course of the uh, of the of the episode. But what I want to dive into resources first, because a lot of people are going to say, well, this is, you know, I, I you know, Hubstaff is obviously a resource that, that they could look at. But I want to I want to find out like what books or what, uh, you know, I mean, you talked about that one link, which, uh, you know, the, the how to how to fire somebody, <laughs> which I right. mean, Google's a great, <laughs> but what like if, if some essential reading or some helpful reading that that somebody can do if they want to kind of get their head wrapped around, you know, bringing a remote team into their into their startup or into their environment. Yeah, there are some good resources out there. Uh, one site that we recently became aware of is remote.co. They uh, interview companies uh, that are working remotely. So you can get a lot of the insights of what's working well for them and what's not off of those interviews. They have some other resources available up there as well. Uh, I'll promote our blog. Uh, we have a university section on the blog, and we've kind of set it up into three tiers. If you're just getting started and don't know anything about remote work, We've got that section. And then if you've been doing it for a little while but want to graduate to the, to the big leagues, and then if you're in the big leagues but you're looking at how would I do this with 100 people, we have that as the third section. So we, we've put a lot of resources into that. Um, and then just I think nowadays remote teams or at least partial remote teams is, is very common. And so you can go to various blogs um, for other startups. I believe the Groove blog. Uh, a lot of their team is remote. I know the Bear Metrics guys, they're all remote. So you can read about how they do stuff on their blog and they talk about the tools they use and, and how they hold people accountable. And so just go around and find different companies that are similar to yours and, and see if they're working remotely and read their blogs. Now, what about the tools you use? I mean, we've talked about Trello. We've talked about Google Docs. Is there anything else that you're using, like say for, uh, or is it fairly, you kind of keep it as lean as you can? Yeah, we don't. We we do have quite a few tools we use. We try to curb that proliferation of them. We we depend on Skype a lot. I know Slack is the very popular solution right now. We may move over to that and uh, join that party. But right now we're content being on Skype. So we set up permanent chat rooms on Skype, and we like it because we can move to voice seamlessly. So that's probably the major reason we're still on it. Right. Um, we use we are big believers in screencasts. So it's not something I had done before being part of this company, but uh, Dave, my co-founder, showed me the value in that. And it's just, it's pretty awesome being able to record a five-minute screencast of you narrating something on your screen. I think it's really powerful. And, and again, you have that archival uh, part built into it. We're really big in keeping a record of things and being able to go back to it or share it with other people. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, one of the things that I did... Um so my wife handles all the administrative stuff and she wanted to figure out how to quickly transfer money from, you know, based on our credit cards. Cause each websites are different, right? Each financial website is different. I said, I'll make a screencast. And I use screen, I use screen flow for that just because I have it already. So why not? And then all I did was I just put the video into, uh, uh into a shared Dropbox folder. And so now she can, and, and the key, I think what most people need to remember is when you're doing a screencast, make it as evergreen as possible. So don't say, Hey, Anne, here's how you do this. Like, just say, here's how you can do this. Because then 
when you're re- if, if Anne's no longer doing it or if Jim's no whoever's no longer you can just pass the video on to them and it's not like you know you're you're dealing with something completely different right that's exactly right so that'd be the number one thing i find a lot of people aren't really doing screencasts so i'd say if you take nothing else from this go ahead and start to just try doing some screencasts i'll bet you'll find a lot of value in it what other tools so we've talked about jing we've talked about skype uh trello are there any other tools that you really use uh google docs of course yeah, I can't mention Google Docs enough. We really depend on that a lot. Let's see, on the productivity side, that I use my own uh, to-do list apps on my computer, and I'm always switching between them, so I wouldn't highly recommend one over another. <laughs> so you're, but, like, you're like me. Well, which ones do you use? Because I'm kind of, I mean, I've got Asana for the productivity team. I've got Todoist for my own stuff, and then Trello, oddly enough, uh, and this is fine, John, John Polster, the producer is like, I'm a big Trello fan. So what I've done, and this is a trick that I think a lot of people need to kind of keep in mind, especially if you're working with others, is that they're all going to, I mean, some of my people are, are, again, they're independent, especially the RevShare people. So I'm not going to say, hey, you need to use this. Like, you know, so we use Slack for the internal communication stuff. But right. um, what I'll do is is to do is because that's my primary one that I use for, you know, my professional stuff that doesn't involve the team. I use the labels and to do is to say, hey, you need to be in Asana to look at this stuff. Or, hey, you need to be in Trello to look at this stuff. So it kind of triggers me to go to the right place. So if you have to use somebody else's tools that you're not necessarily you don't want to go all in with them and you really are comfortable with the tool you're using, then just use either the labels or tags or, I mean, contacts in OmniFocus and just create triggers that are going to send you to the place you need to be, you know, so that way you can accomplish the work, right? Right. So what do you, what, what what's the to-do, I mean, you've used a few, so give me, give me examples of which ones you use. Yeah, I would say uh, I've used the Do app. That's the one I keep coming back to. I'm not in love with it, uh, but it's a very simple little... Do.com or is it D-U-E? Which one? D-U-E. Oh, that's the iOS one, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. So I've been using that. I like the fact that it, it makes a little sound every once in a while when it reminds you like, hey, this thing's coming up or this thing's out. I think we yeah. heard it a couple times during the episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, that's cool. They, now people know, hey, what was that dinging in the background? I'm like, hey, it's do. And do is basically reminders on steroids. Exactly. So yeah, I try to keep it pretty simple. I've tried Evernote a few times in the past. I, I start and stop with that. Uh, and I'll, OmniFocus, I'm really learning to love OmniFocus and get into that. And the reason why is a blog post uh, up on Bear Metrics blog. Mm-hmm. Uh, Josh Pigford, the founder, had a really great process that he detailed for how he does stuff inside OmniFocus. And I've been trying to adopt that process because I see a lot of merits to it. Yeah, OmniFocus is the big, I mean, obviously, I've talked to, I mean, Brett Kelly's just written a book about it. Um, you know, the, the guys at Asian Efficiency have a whole course surrounding it that I've, I've promoted and looked at. And I mean, OmniFocus is one of those ones where if you're working individually, and I've done a talk for the Omni Group back in back at uh, was three years ago, I was an OmniFocus user, still have it, occasionally get tempted to go back to it because I love the way it does, you know, a lot of things. Um, but if you're if you're working with a team, it's tough because so I'd be interested. I think that post, if if uh, and I'll give it a look. I would imagine that it kind of helps you with that process. Is if you're working with other people, how you can kind of mitigate that a bit. And that's part of yeah. And I was actually thinking about this earlier today. Is that it's hard for me to keep up on these processes because all of these iOS or Mac based apps that I use for for tasks, they're very solo. They're not really mm-hmm. suited for the team. So that post that Josh wrote is really how he digests the tasks from their from their collaborative task system and how he puts them into his OmniFocus system. So there's a translation that has to happen, which is a little bit of extra work, and nobody else can really see his OmniFocus setup. You know, he's just using it himself. So yeah. I think that that makes it hard to keep with it. Um, but th- that's the current problem. But it's a front end thing too, right? Like if you do the work up front and you've got the approach built in there, then then it becomes second nature to you. So he's doing this probably, it's second nature. He sees something that shows up in the collaborative stuff and says, okay, I need to deal with this. So this is going into OmniFocus. So that way I can have the focus I need to deal with it properly as opposed to all the other noise that's going on around him. Exactly. That's exactly it. So the, your your collaborative version is really the giant memory bank of everything that needs to be done. And then organizing that into what am I going to do today or Mm -hmm. maybe tomorrow, but let's stay very focused on 24 to 48 hours. And then, you know, we'll let the the online version just cover everything that needs to be done and a way for me to see what's assigned to other people. It's kind of like what I do with Todoist. 
really. I mean, Todoist is kind of the same thing where I, it's the one I love using because of just the fact that it's got the, I mean, there's so much, it does have collaborative elements to it. So my wife and I can share stuff in it because my wife will not go near uh, some of the tools that I use. She's not, <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's, she's a dyed in the wool, like put it on the calendar and I'll do it. I'm like, Oh no, 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 no. Tasks don't go on calendars, but uh, exactly. I'm with you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's an old GTD thing from David Allen. Uh, but I mean, for me, uh, to do is just, again, it's the trigger of, okay, I need to go check Asana today because Asana has got everything. And then what I, what I do is I say, okay, here are the things that I definitely need to focus on. They're going into to do so I can see them. And then that way they definitely get the focus that they need. So, I mean, yep. it, it's, and, and yeah, for some people, that's going to be, wow, that seems redundant. But you know what? It's not redundant if it works, in my mind. You know what I mean? Like Because yeah. the redundancy is if I put it in the same pl- in two places and the same, same result occurs. Well, uh, I think that that pretty much wraps up what we need. I mean, I, I got to get back to fi- hiring people. I think that's my thing. I got to get back to this. <laughs> so, so, Jared, where can people find you when you are not, uh, you know, well, you are always working remotely, but where can people just find you? Yeah, you can find me at Jared Brown on Twitter. It's J A R E D Brown, uh, and and feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you can also send me an email at uh, Jared at Hubstaff dot com, and I'll be happy to reply to any questions people have. And uh, I'm always interested in talking about this stuff. So if you're listening to this and you have a question for me, don't hesitate to reach out. Awesome! Thanks so much for joining me this week on the podcast, Jared. Thanks, Mike. So there you have it. A great conversation. I learned a lot. I hope you did too. If you wanted to learn even more, then you can go to patreon.com slash productivity and get the whole discussion. There's an additional 16 minutes of content in this episode alone. And then look at all the back catalog that has additional content and all the bonus episodes that you would get and all the perks that you can have depending on what level you contribute at. Just go to patreon.com slash productivity Show your support. Help me make the show even better, and uh, you know, increase the listenership. Make it, you know, I mean, this is this is exactly what the people in the community are doing. You can be part of the community too. There's an active, a kind of forum style thing that goes on in, in for every episode. You can comment, and I'm in there, and I'm commenting with you, so you get pretty close access to me on a regular basis. So this patronage model is working. What they're doing at Patreon is phenomenal. I'm glad to be part of it. So head over to patreon.com slash productivityist if you are able and willing to contribute to any kind of monetary support. And I'd love to see you there. Uh, until next week, uh, again, take a look back at the show notes, you know, learn and, and, and go over some of the stuff that Jared talked about. And uh, I will see you next week for a brand new shiny episode of the podcast. Until then, stop guessing, start going, and keep moving things forward. We'll see you next week.